Hello and welcome to another presentation in the Ladal Opening Webinar Series 2021. My name is Martin Schweinberger and together with Michael Hall, I'm co-directing Ladal, the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory at the School of Languages and Cultures at the University of Queensland in Australia. Before we start, I'd like to read out an acknowledgement of country, which we do here in Australia, to express our respect and gratitude towards the Indigenous people of Australia. So I'd like to say that we as members of the University of Queensland acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands from which we are broadcasting this webinar. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I would also like to say that we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian as well as global society. If you'd like to know more about the DAL and the resources we provide, please feel free to explore the DAL website. The URL of the DAL website is shown on the screen. You can also find information about past and upcoming presentations in the DAL opening webinar series 2021 on the events subpage of the um, uh, DAL website. If you want to keep up with what's going on at Ladal, please feel free to follow us on Twitter. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, please do not hesitate to reach out to us by email. You can also follow us on Facebook if you like. So without further ado, uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tanya Seeley. Tanya is a Tanya Track Assistant Professor in English Language at the University of Helsinki. Her research includes uh, corpus linguistics, digital humanities, historical social linguistics, and linguistic productivity. She's also interested in the social embedding of language variation and change in general, including gendered styles in the history of English and extra linguistic factors influencing language change. Her overarching aim is to develop new ways of understanding language variation and change, often in collaboration with experts from other fields. Her current project combines historical social linguistics, intellectual history, book history, and data science to analyze 18th century publications and publishing networks. And that's also what her talk is about today. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Tanya Sely with her talk, Language Variation and Change in 18th Century Publications and Publishing Networks. Here are my slides, can you see them? Yes, yes, we can, thanks. Perfect. So indeed, my topic is language variation and change in 18th century publications and publishing networks. So here are the contents of the talk. I'll first introduce the premises of our rights of project where we study these issues. Uh, then I'll talk about two pilot studies. If I have time, I probably will. So the first one is about neologisms in private writing. So this is something we did in a previous project and we are now hoping to apply the same pipeline in a way to this public writing. And then the second pilot study is about the public sphere. So studying actually the word public in these pu publications, which should tell us something interesting about developments in the public sphere. So, and at the end, I'll just go through some conclusions and what we are going to do next in the project. So, RISEP, short for Rise of Commercial Society and 18th Century Publishing. This is an Academy of Finland funded project. Uh, it started last year and it runs until 2024. And the PIs are Mikko Tolonen, who is an intellectual historian, also does book history and digital humanities. And then myself from linguistics. And we have two postdocs. We are currently looking to hire a history postdoc. But then our linguistics postdoc is Aatu Liimatta, who has already talked in this series, actually. So you might remember him. And uh, from the history side, we have had a couple of people working in the project. So we had Mark J. Hill, who is actually here at the bottom left of this picture. We've been meeting mostly over Zoom, of course, due to the current situation. So that's what it looks like for us. And then we have had Iiro Tihonen, who is a PhD student in history. And we're lucky to have a lot of interesting and really nice collaborators here. 
So from the linguistic side, we have people like Douglas Biber, who is an expert in register studies. And I think this will help us a lot because we are interested in kind of, well, we've got this mass of 18th century data and we don't know what's in there. So we might be interested in kind of trying to identify regist registers there. Then we have Susan Fitzmorris, who has looked into, for example, the historical social linguistics of the 18th century. And she has also been leading this linguistic DNA project where they are identifying concepts in the history of English. And then we have Tony McEnery from Lancaster, who is an expert in corpus linguistics and who has also kind of, he works on historical discourse analysis and he does a lot of collaboration with historians. So he's a really good contact in that sense. And then we have Leslie Milroy, who is an expert. Well, she wrote the book on language and social networks, and we are interested in networks here in this project. So it's really great to have her as well. And then from the history side, we have people, these are mostly working on book history, I think. So we have Simon Burroughs, Richard Scher, and Mark Tausey. And Richard has also worked a lot on the Enlightenment, so the 18th century, which is our focus here. And then from data science or computing, we have three people who are all in here in Finland and we are working quite closely with them. So we have Leo Lahti, who is a data scientist in, at the University of Turku. He has also done bioinformatics and stuff like that. So he knows biology as well as history. Uh, then we have Eetu Mäkelä from this university, the University of Helsinki. And he does, uh, he studies humanities, computing interaction. So he's really interested in uh, developing new tools for humanities scholars to use and how humanities scholars can best use digital tools and methods. So this is extremely helpful for us, of course, and I've worked with Eetu before. And then we have Jukka Suomela, who is actually an expert on theoretical computer science, but for our project, he kind of develops these interfaces where we can uh, combine statistical analyses with then close reading and kind of looking at things from multiple perspectives. And so he's a really good programmer as well. I think he would classify himself as a computer scientist. And then we of course work within the COMHIS and varying research groups here in Helsinki. So COMHIS is the Helsinki Computational History Group and then varying is the research unit for variation, context and change in English. And I think we already had an introduction to varying in this talk series. But what do we mean by the rise of commercial society? Well, in the late 18th century, it said that the civil society starts to be perceived through the lens of commerce. And a very famous example of this is Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations. But we would like to kind of go beyond that. So people have studied that almost to death. And uh, we would want to kind of widen the scope and look at the overall intellectual shift and change in language use, which can be kind of said to have brought about a new era of political and moral philosophy. And uh, this is also one way of looking at the enlightenment. So a key part of that was the rise of commercial society. And what's really important here is the printing press as a vehicle of change. So there was a massive expansion, expansion of printing in the 18th century which of course spread knowledge. It brought about social mobility and also maybe most importantly brought about new discourses and disseminated them. And it has been said that print media and publishing networks actually enabled the rise of commercial society. And of course this didn't happen in a vacuum. So what we are going to be looking at are cultural transfers. So for example, Scottish, American and French influences on British print media. For example, how, who kind of did the French translations? How did they come about and what kind of networks are surrounding those? So our objectives are as follows. We want to discover the publishing networks that facilitate the rise of commercial society in Britain and America and study their development over time. We want to analyze the language of commercial society and how it changes over time. And we want to identify individuals and social groups within the networks who facilitate such linguistic changes. And these are not necessarily only authors now, but they can also be printers and publishers in the network. And then we also want to assess the reception of key works and actors by analyzing readership. 
And finally, kind of formulate an overview of the rise of commercial society and its connection to the main printing networks of cultural production. So I'm going to be focusing on these first three objectives today, and I'll talk about them a bit more later. But first, let's look at our materials. So we are using basically three different kinds of data for this. So first of all, there's bibliographic metadata. So for example, the English short title catalog, which is a comprehensive union catalog. So it combines data from lots of different library catalogs. And it lists British and American publications from 1475 to 1801. And it's basically got all of the publications that we know of from the 18th century. And this metadata has been harmonized and enriched by people at the ComHIS research group. So what this means is, for example, the authors. So there is a field in this database for author. But since this catalog was kind of, it was compiled before we thought about maybe consistency and machine readability, the author names are not in a machine readable format. And also, we don't know which authors are the same author. So that's something that we've been trying to kind of identify at ComHIS. So, well, what is the first name? What is the last name? Are these two people the same author? And then also get more information on the authors. So for example, their gender and uh, date of birth, stuff like that. And then we are using full text archives, for example, 18th century collections online or ECHO. And this is now the most comprehensive full, full text collection of British publications from 1701 to 1800. So it's only a subset of what's listed in the ESTC, but it is a substantial chunk, chunk of everything that was published in Britain in the 18th century. And for this, we have a local version that we acquired from Gale. So we don't, we are not kind of tied to the interface provided by Gale, but we can do nice data science stuff on the local version. And then for, for our uh, lexical studies, we also use lexicographical metadata, for example, the Oxford English Dictionary and its historical thesaurus. And here we use information like etymology, semantics, spelling variants, the first attestation dates, and so on. And for these as well, we have local versions that we have acquired from Oxford University Press. Then a bit about our methods. So basically, we want to combine our traditional methods from our fields, book history, intellectual history, and historical social linguistics with then more statistical and computational methods. So we use something that we like to call bibliographic data science. So we use the metadata from the ESTC to reconstruct and analyze publishing networks in terms of time, people, places and also the materiality of the books. So we have information like the size of the books and so on. Uh, then we have historical social linguistics, of course. And here, the key thing is linking the metadata from the ESTC and also from the lexicographical resources with the full texts to study language change, both lexical and other, in the networks. And then we want to identify these key individuals and social groups. And we are going to augment our knowledge with methods from historical semantics, historical discourse analysis, and register studies with the help of our collaborators. So going back to the objectives, so publishing networks, we want to discover these. And so what are these actually? They are shifting relationships between authors, printers, publishers, and other actors in the history of print. And uh, they can be used to kind of study book historical questions, like to understand the development towards a tightly organized wholesale business and how this London monopoly of printing came about. But crucially, these networks also represent intellectual, religious and social groups that are connected by shared endeavors and interests. So they are not only publishing networks, they are actual social networks. The people often met each other, they lived in London. So so they are of interest to historical social linguistics. And our aim is to identify and characterize intellectual movements and networks that were relevant to the rise of commercial society. And we do this in a new way. So we use the ESTC as a quantitative research tool to analyze these networks. Right, then we come to objective two, which is more my ballpark. So the language of commercial society. So first we want to chart the use of 
and spread of new vocabulary in the networks. For example, lexical innovations relating to commercial society. And our aim here is to kind of understand how the discourse develops over time. And we also want to analyze some grammatical and orthographic changes to kind of discover potential links with the rise of commercial society. So historical social linguistics is all about looking at sort of the interrelationships between language and society. So for example, do we see simultaneous increases in the rate of change of these changes? And can we relate these to some real world events and things that were going on? And then can we maybe identify specific variants that are associated with discourse related to commercial society? So for example, I mentioned the word public and it can be written in two different ways. It can be written with an IC or ICK. And maybe it's the new IC variant that kind of becomes specifically related to commercial society. That's one hypothesis. And then thirdly, we want to identify these key individuals and social groups. So individual facilitators of language change in the publishing networks. And people have really kind of focused on the famous enlightenment figures before in the historical research. And we want to shift the focus to maybe less well-known but pivotal individuals. And these, as I mentioned, they are not necessarily only authors, but they can also be printers and publishers in the networks. And uh, this data also allows us to test, test hypotheses from social linguistics. So for example, it has been kind of hypothesized that the innovators are often people who are not central in the networks, but they are kind of second order members and they have lots of weak social ties. And it is through these ties that, that the innovations kind of spread. And then the more central actors are perhaps the ones who then consolidate, consolidate the change and kind of establish it. And we also want to track the diffusion of the changes across these networks, diachronically, regionally and socially. So we will be looking at things like age, gender and maybe social status as well. And because we are analyzing networks and changes that are related to the rise of commercial society, we expect that these key individuals and social groups that we identify will be relevant to both intellectual history and historical social linguistics, which is nice. But let's move on to our pilot study. So the first one is about social aspects of neologism use in 18th century letters. And this is joint work with Eetu Mäkilä and then Mika Hämäläinen, who was a PhD student in language technology and now he's a postdoc. And this was done within the Stratas project, which is interfacing structured and unstructured data. So basically metadata and text in social linguistic research on language change. And it was funded by the Academy of Finland Digihum program. Uh, the blog still stands and you can go there if you'd like to see what we did. And I was the leader of the Natas subproject, which was the social embedding of new words in early English correspondence. And the rationale for this research was that previous research into new words had mostly focused on lexicographical data, which is kind of biased towards well-known authors. So we know that the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, the original principle there was to kind of take the good, the best authors and look at them and take their new words. So uh, yeah, maybe people like Shakespeare are kind of overrepresented there. But then the corpora of early English correspondence, which were compiled here in Helsinki, uh, cover a much wider social spectrum. So basically, if you were literate, you could write letters. So anybody who was literate, of course, many people were not, but anyway. And then it's, it represents a kind of speech-like genre. So it's nice for us social linguists. We are interested in speech and we think that is the hotbed of change. So the corpus that we use here, as I mentioned, this is now private writing. And in our current project, we are then kind of expanding to public writing. But the seek is personal letters from about 1400 to 1800. We have more than a thousand writers, almost 12,000 letters and more than 5 million words. So this is very small data compared to ECHO, but it's quite complex anyway. And we have been able to find some interesting things there. 
And this was now specifically compiled for historical social linguistics. So we have metadata from the letters, the writers and recipients. So we basically know the gender and social rank of pretty much every writer there, for example. And as I mentioned, it was compiled at the University of Helsinki, and the team was led by Professor Terto Nevalainen and Dr. Helena Raumolin Brunberg. And I came in when we were compiling the 18th century extension, so I have done something for this course as well. And it's based on published editions of letters, just because that was a much quicker way of getting the data, so we could just scan the editions and do OCR and then check that the spell, everything was correct, as opposed to sort of transcribing these letters from manuscript. But of course, it means that there is one layer between us, as, or maybe a couple of layers between us and the original manuscript. So uh, the reliability is perhaps not perfect, although we did do spot, spot checks, and this is supposed to be like an original spelling. All of these editions claim to be original spelling and so on. Of course, for our lexical studies, it helps to have a standardized spelling version as well. So we have done that for the corpus. Uh, unfortunately, it only standardizes sufficiently frequent words, and then new words are often not that frequent. So maybe they haven't been standardized in this version. Right, so our research questions were, who are the innovators or early adopters of new words, and which social groups do they represent? Then how do the new words spread socially, geographically, diachronically? And which semantic domains do they represent? And why are they created and established? Can they be linked to specific historical events, changes in culture and society? Do they carry social meanings? So uh, this is the interesting approach that we came up, up with. And this is something that we are looking forward to now applying to ECHO as well. So what we have done is we have automatically mapped each word in the corpus to lexicographical data and contemporary published texts and compared the first attestation dates. And because of the spelling variation that I mentioned, the standardized version is not enough. We need to do some additional normal normalization. And then we automatically retrieve related lexicographical data that's of interest to us, <clears throat> like etymologies from the OED and the historical thesaurus and also the Middle English Dictionary for this project. And we also automatically retrieve data from these databases of contemporary published texts. So in this case, that means early English books online, 18th century collections online, British Library newspapers and the Bernie and Nichols collections, which also contain mostly newspapers. And we have developed an interface for pruning the possible neologisms found. And we would also need an interface for exploring the social factors. So this is what the pipeline looks like so far. And it, I know it looks quite confusing, but if you look at the middle section here, it's actually pretty kind of understandable. So we start with the corpus seek, then we normalize and lemmatize it using various methods. Then, then we do the filtering and analysis of the new words, and finally we get to the result. And at each, each stage, we use these additional resources to help us. So for example, to discover variant spellings, to help us with mapping, and normalization, we use the seek itself and we use the dictionaries, which also include some variant spellings. And then for the normalization, we use some advanced methods that require a language model so that we get from the British National Corpus. And then in the filtering stage, we look at uh, lexicographical data, so the historical thesaurus, Middle East Dictionary, OED, for first attestations, senses, and etymology. And from the corpus itself, we look at the social metadata and the letter context. And then the public text, we kind of compare with the appearances in those and see how maybe if there are any early attestations there, but also do the words kind of appear there later and do they seem to spread there, which is interesting. Right. So talking about the mapping to the dictionary, so first we had to pr 
prepare the corpus. So we converted it to Unicode, we removed most of the punctuation, we tokenized it, then we tried to lemmatize it with uh, the natural language toolkit, and then tried to map the lemmas to the OED using a local JSON version. And then the normalization that had been done for the standardized version, we extended these already performed normalizations to the 15th century, which hadn't yet been standardized. And then we used another normalization program called Morphodona to automatically normalize further. And when it, then we tried mapping again. <clears throat> and at this stage, we successfully mapped about 50,000 word forms, which left us with 100,000 still unmapped. So we wanted to try to kind of do something to map these as well. Of course, we can't map everything because we have things like the proper names, which are not listed in the OED. So additional normalization had to be done. <laughs> and Mika had the idea to use machine translation. And this actually, this had been done. The statistical machine translation had been done by some other people as well before. So there are two different types. There's neural machine translation and then the statistical and neural is the kind of fancy new thing in language technology. And then we also did some, some stuff with the known normalizations as input. And uh, uh, yeah, and this machine translation was character based. So it's not word based, but character based. Apparently this works better. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, the language model we used came from the British National Corpus. So those were the two methods here. But then we came up with some additional methods. So looking at edit distance, filtering by semantic similarity and pronunciation ish. Oops. And then we tried extending these previously compiled normalization rules to all words. For example, you can be V anywhere, some stuff like that. And then we kind of, we got pretty nice results. And it seems that the neural machine translation was often the best, but not always. And then we run into the problem, okay, how do we select the best normalization? And uh, here it kind of fell apart and we were not able to automatically select the best one. And then the accuracy ended up being not that great. So we kind of revisited this <laughs> later on. And since the neural machine translation was the best method, we said, okay, we'll take that and how can, we, how, how can we make it even better? And this is now Mika's domain, so I don't understand everything, but he changed the neural network to a bidirectional recurrent neural network. And then he kind of looked at the top 10 prediction and mapped those to the OED and also used something called Stacy. Yeah, and it sort of worked, but if we look at the 18th century, it really didn't work that well. So it was like 50, 50 even with the OAD. So we think this is because we had kind of already done the easy cases. And in the 18th century, the variation is maybe not so kind of predictable as in the earlier centuries. So there are not, not these easy rules that, okay, it's U versus V and that's it. But it's like uh, the language has been kind of standardized, but then we have a lot of people who don't have a lot of education who kind of write by ear and they don't know what the conventions are. So there, there's somehow a lot of variation there. Right. So th this is where we got, and this is by no means perfect. So it's maybe not that usable at the moment, but I think we, we are going to continue with this. And there's not going to be as much spelling variation in the echo because that's published texts and kind of the printing press and stuff. <laughs> Standardized language quite well, in a way, quite quickly. But uh, there are other issues in that data. There are these optical character recognition errors that maybe produce stuff that could be normalized in a similar manner. So we might be able to use this in the echo data as well. Right. Well, once we have done or not done the normalization, we want to retrieve the related data. So from the OED, we got all fields except pronunciation. From the Middle English Dictionary, we got basically years, so we can compare the first adaptation dates and also the link to the OED. And then from the contemporary published texts, 
we took the term frequency and the document frequency before and after our first attestation in the corpus so that we can compare those and to look at things like okay does it seem like it occurs previously in these published texts and also is the term consolidated in later published writing and then from the seek we took all of the metadata on the letters senders and recipients and this was done using scripts written by Nika and the data is was collected in a massive excel file so that's our method there there maybe not so advanced but mm, works and then we made this interface for filtering the candidates this is called FICA filtering and categorization and it can be used for many other tasks in kind of corpus linguistics as well so it was developed by Edu and it's described in our publication there and this is what it looks like so basically it's a bit like Excel, so a spreadsheet on the left with each of the new word candidates on a line of its own. And then we have some information on them. And what's really helpful is that it automatically loads all of the instances here on the right. So all of the hits in the corpus, and we can look at the wider context by hovering over it, or we can click on it to go and see even more. And then it loads the instances in the contemporary published texts. And then it also loads the word in the Oxford English Dictionary. So I can look at all of this information when deciding is this an actual new word. Right, so let's moving on to the case, actual case study of 18th century new words in the Sikh. So we are looking at the long 18th century from 1680 to 1800. In this data set, we have 315 writers, about 5,000 words uh, or letters and about 2 million words. And the criteria for the neologism candidates was that the first attestation in the SEEK had to be earlier or the same as the first attestation in the OED, and that it, the word could occur in no more than 100 contemporary published texts before the first attestation in the SEEK. So why can it occur before the SEEK? Because of these OCR errors. So for example, this word catchy here, all of the instances in the published text were actually errors, so they were not the word cat, catchy. So we found that, okay, if, if we let it occur in maximum 100, then that's, that kind of gives us some sort of limit, but it, it's also still possible that it's a new word, even if it occurs, seems to occur before our first attestation. Right. And thanks to our automatic procedures, I only had 220 candidates to filter in this FICA interface, and I found 81 new words. So, who are the early adopters was our question, or one of them. And uh, here you can see the top people and how many new words they used. So when we compare this to the number of running words that we have from them in the corpus, uh, these are the people who use surprisingly many new words. Definitely Thomas Twining, he, he's a real weirdo. So he's one of my favorite people in the corpus. He, he, he's really creative with language. He's just a clergyman, but I mean, he's also a classical scholar. So he, he knows his Latin and Greek and so on. So he can do a lot with language. And of course we have authors. So we have Jane Austen, we have Jeremy Bentham, we have Thomas Gray, which kind of makes sense, okay, that they would use new words. Then we also have people from lower social rank. So we have John Jackson, who was, I think, a farmer's son, and then both of us, St. Michel, who I think he was, he had something to do with the sea, like he was he a naval officer, or maybe not even an officer, but some sort of seaman. And then looking at people from whom we have a lot of words, sort of running words, but not a lot of new words. We have Lady Mary Wortley Montague, so I don't know why she is conservative. And we can also detect some social networks here, or sort of we, we know, for example, that Thomas Twining knew the Burnies. So Fanny Burney is an author, and Charles Burney is her father and a music historian. And they were really close friends. And then also these John Jackson and Balthazar St. Michel knew each other. So they were both related to Samuel Pepys, who some of you might know, a famous diary writer. So some examples, what did they use? So first of all, this is John Jackson writing to John Evelyn 
And I think this was a sad occasion. So I think this was the death of Samuel Pepys, was it even? But anyway, he uses the word uncommonness here. So I must, must not omit acquainting you, sir, that upon opening his body, which the uncommonness of his case required of us for our, our own satisfaction, as well as public good, not the use of the word public there, for example, uh, there was found in his left kidney a nest of no less than seven stones of the most irregular figures your imagination can frame and weighing together four and a half ounces. So uncommonness. Maybe not that, com well, it is a complex word, but then again, the suffix nest, which I have studied, is quite a productive one. So this might have been fairly easy in a way to produce as a new word. Uh, then we have Thomas Twining writing to Charles Burney. Uh, jargonic is the new word here. But there's also another word which is, doesn't occur in the OED at all. So in tune nest. So let's see what Thomas says. But I don't recollect any single word in our language but tune that expresses the in tuneness of an interval. Intonation is rather more scientific and jargonic than I like. So that's a two for one from Thomas Twining. All right, but looking at social ranks, so kind of abstracting away from the individuals now and going to the social groups. So the ones that use surprisingly many new words compared to the number of running words we have from them, well, there's lower clergy, but that's due to Thomas Twining, basically. But then other non-gentry, the lowest category of all. And there we have John Jackson, who was already mentioned. He was a farmer's son. He was upwardly mobile. Then we have Ignatius Sancho, who was the son of a slave. And again, upwardly mobile. And then we have George, George Cully, who was a farmer. Well, he was more of a gentleman farmer, maybe. But anyway, really working in agriculture with his hands in the dirt and growing or sort of breeding animals and stuff like that. And surprisingly few compared to the amount of data we have from them are royalty. So maybe they are kind of conservative language users in this respect. So some examples. Now we have the gentleman or otherwise farmer, George, writing to his brother, Matthew. Mr. Collins' prized stuff is not very capital to handle, but rather catchy to look at. So that's the catchy that I was looking at in the figure interface. And then we have Sancho, who is pictured here, writing to Mrs. Coxedge. We hope he is well and enjoys this fine weather unplagued by flies and unbeaten by fleas. So unbeaten was antidotes the OED. I think it's a nice formation. Many of these are kind of designed to maybe amuse the recipients. And this, this seems to be one of those instances. And then we have the, I think, one of the few, or maybe the only new word used by uh, royalty. So Princess Elizabeth also pictured there. So our dear mother is well, but hurried. My sister very fussy and agitated. The rest of the family in full trim, though heartful from the thoughts of so soon being separated with laughing faces to keep up one another's spirits. So fussy, not that fancy a word, quite similar to catchy. So. That's what the royalty used. So it's not that the royalties letters would be particularly like uh, formal or anything. So this is these are family letters. But for some reason, they're not that into new words. So then looking at other social factors like gender, age, education, and also register. So for gender, we have more data from men and more neologisms as well. So we weren't able to say at this point, is this statistically significant? But what does seem to be, well, I don't know if it's statistically significant, but what we can observe if, is that there are fewer neologisms by younger people and less well-educated people. <clears throat> and this kind of matches up with previous research on present day Dutch, which seems far-fetched, but I mean, this hasn't been studied very much. So this is the, <laughs> the only comparison that I could find. But uh, there, Karen Keune found that the highest lexical productivity was exhibited by highly educated older men. So maybe that's something that could be, well, not a universal, but fairly common. 
and it kind of makes sense that okay as you get older your vocabulary gets bigger and also maybe your ability to create new words uh, but there were also exceptions so it wasn't sort of uh, it could depend on the suffix for example so some suffixes were used by more productively by younger women for example and then what we found was surprisingly many new words in letters to close friends and fewer to nuclear family members and this is consistent with the so-called bulge theory by Nessa Wolfson where a less stable relationship kind of triggers more creative language use so you are negotiating more and you're trying to keep the other person interested and stuff like that so maybe you're you want to use entertaining words as well and then semantics so i looked at the historical thesaurus and here are the number of new words per category and broadly it seems that Many of the words are related to people, so this is probably kind of an artifact of the type of text. So we are looking at letters and they are very interactive and you talk about each other and your own news and third parties and so on. So many words are related to emotion, mental capacity, attention and judgment, behavior, manner of action, so words like ill-natured, cleverality, nature, missish, fussy. Uh, then, but there are also words related to society, and to, some of these are kind of clearly, clearly related to societal changes and stuff like um, advances in science and uh, industrialization and so on. So, for example, wagon way is a sort of artificial road for coal wagons, stuff like that. And then, of course, we are interested in trade, so I've highlighted those words in yellow. So knickknackatory, I'm not sure why that's straight. It just means laboratory. <laughs> but then there's words like uninsured and income, which are clearly kind of finance or trade. And then there are words related to communication, work, faith, authority, and so on. So the rest of the words are like escritoire, the writing desk, I suppose, chaplaincy, envoyship. And then world, these are, this is kind of a mixed bag, the world words, action space. So words like gods and unsto don't really <laughs> relate to each other, but that's the final mixed bag there. So to conclude with our big data approach, these massive databases and the automatic pipeline, it's been possible to quickly discover dozens of neologisms in millions of words of running text. But of course, we're missing a lot. So there are homonyms, there's zero derivation. So we are only looking sort of stupidly at strings of words and trying to map them to the first word that we can find in the OED. And so multi-word units. So we are now only looking at single words separated by spaces. Uh, spelling variation is still an issue and could disproportionately affect the lower ranks. Or in ECHO, maybe there are some documents or groups of documents that have been scanned in poorly and then those could be kind of where we don't find as many many new words just because the data is so poor so the optical character recognition and of course there's the question are the are these actual first attestations probably not or maybe some of them are so can we kind of separate the innovators from the early adopters it's really difficult at least so in the future we want to extend this to echo we want to ask more focused questions, for example, because it, it takes a lot of time and effort and it's kind of, there's still a lot of work for the analyst. So by asking more focused questions, we are able to kind of delve deeper and yeah. So we could ask something like who are the coiners of nonce words? So ones that don't appear, only appear a couple of times or then so maybe relevantly to our current project, we could ask something like, who are the early, early adopters of vocabulary related to commercial society and vocabulary that comes into general use later? And we still want to improve normalization and pipeline and integrate social analysis functionality into the pipeline. Well, I've been talking quite a lot, but we still have another pilot study. I think I'll be quicker with this one. So the second pilot study, I actually haven't been part of this. So this was done at Comhis. Well, I kind of I looked in our letter corpus for some instances of public, but that's the extent of my kind of participation. 
So this is work by Antti Kanner, Mark J. Hill, Jani Marjonen, Villevaara, Eetu Mäkelä, Leo Lähkinen, Jukko Tolonen. And Antti is the linguist here and the rest are, um, well, mostly, well, there are historians and data scientists involved. So the topic is fears of public in 18th century Britain. And now we are actually using the echo as our material. So this is what we will be talking about. Why look at public? Then there are some quantitative claims that can be made based on the data. So there seems to be an increase in the frequency and variety of the use of public. There seems to be a decrease in the religious use. And there is some syntactic change in the use of public. And then how is this relevant to historical meaning? We'll do a comparative analysis of common versus public. And we will also do a, what they call categorical analysis. So we are clustering by author and seeing which authors form clear clusters in the use of public. And then some conclusions. So in the 18th century, it has been said that a public space opened for middle-class middle people who had previously been limited to the private sphere. So this, the, the emerging middle class kind of made these quasi-political moves to grasp power from existing political and religious holders through public discourse. So there were things like clubs and associations and coffee houses were really important, but then also print media. So they started writing for print and they established things like periodicals where they could discuss issues that were of interest to them. And uh, Jürgen Habermas has uh, claimed that the emergence of words like Öffentlichkeit in German and public and publicity in English are indicative of this change in the public sphere. And he actually did a kind of qualitative analysis of Öffentlichkeit, but nobody has looked at public in English. A lot of historians have talked about it, but they haven't done a proper analysis. So the data from ECHO and the ESTC allow us to study this. And the goal here is to identify and describe this transformation of the public sphere by using the word public as an indicator of publicness. And this is just a pilot study, so we'll see this is kind of, it doesn't solve everything, but it goes some way to kind of trying to do that. So first of all, we can see that the frequency of the word public rises. And so it's the light blue one in this graph, for example. So it kind of more than doubles during the 18th century. But maybe more interestingly, public words like, or sort of combinations like public opinion or public mind also increase in frequency and especially towards the end of the 18th century. So here we have public opinion kind of rising quite sharply. And then there's the public mind over here, which is an interesting kind of personification of public. And there is also growth, but also stability in the usage of new public biograms. So public something. So here we have the number of new public biograms over time and it seems to increase. But then also we have some stability. So when the new words come, they kind of, they don't go out of use, but they stay in use to some extent. So they stabilize. And what's really clear also is a drop in religious biograms of public. So I don't know, there's things like public impieties, public synagogues, public worship, public prayers, public mass, and so on. People just don't use that anymore so much. And it's not just that religious discourse as a whole kind of um, goes away. So apparently the graph on the right kind of shows that there is no sort of clear relationship between the use of public in religious backgrounds and religious words as a whole. So this is something that actually happens as and is not just a function of the fact that the people talk less about religion as a whole. And there's a shift in syntax in the use of public. Uh, this is now looking at pamphlets, which were kind of often very topical, and they were these brief things written by often the middle class as well. And these uh, so this is a vector space where the similarities so 
points are years and the years are close to each other if they are similar based on syntactic relations. For example, is public a direct object of a verb? Is, is it an adjective modifier of a noun? And so on. 138 relations total. And then it's been compressed into two, two dimensions here. We can see that the uh, years from 1700 to 1740 are all clustered here and there seems to be stability. And then there's kind of a shift starting from the 1740s, 50s and a steady shift from 1760 onwards. And when we step out of the vector space, we can actually see that the main change is <clears throat> for, from a nominal subject, like talking about the public, to adjective modifier, like public I, which is interesting. And we can also compare kind of synonymous words, so common versus public, and looking at uh, are they syntactically, syntactically similar. So the red here is the adjective modifier use, and then the blue is direct object and green is the nominal subject. And we can see that common is quite kind of stable. So the adjective modifier use is the most frequent one throughout the period, there's no real change. Whereas for public, everything is pretty infrequent at the beginning, and then the adjective modifier use really takes off from the mid century maybe onwards. And the other ones are bubbling on. So that they are they are different in this respect. And also then we can zoom in even more. So looking at the bigrams, so the adjective modifiers and now zooming in one particular construction. So good common good versus public good. And we can see now this is divergence in meaning on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And we can see that common good kind of becomes less divergent over time, whereas public good becomes maybe even more divergent. And we can also see the shift from public written with a CK to it written with, with just the C. And apparently the historians have also identified that some of these sort of periods of greater divergence are related to real world events potentially. So there is the seven years war right around here. And I think there was the French revolution here. So definitely more research would be needed to kind of establish is this really <laughs> related to that, but that's a good hypothesis. Right. Then let's look at the economic context, which is of course interesting to us in our current project. So looking at public money versus common money, public money is definitely kind of being talked about more and more over time. And there's public debt versus common debt. Again, they kind of start out as fairly similar in frequency, but then public takes over. And then public finances versus common finances. Again, public definitely increases massively. So this is something that again should be looked at more through close reading and try to understand why, why is public different, how is public different from common and what is it, what is it about it that kind of is good for the users. Then we come to the authorial use of public and this is something that I'm really interested in. So uh, the authors have been here classified into some groups. So there, there's like Scottish Enlightenment, French Enlightenment. Then there's like topics like law and religion. So what they wrote about. And then there's generally like American writers. And we can see here in this space how their use of public clusters or not. So what we can see is that the religious authors cluster quite neatly here on the right. And so the legal ones kind of sort of as well here towards the bottom and maybe left. And then uh, the French and Scottish Enlightenment, maybe a bit more mixed, but still they are discernible. So writers like Voltaire Rousseau and then Smith and Hume in the Scottish Enlightenment. But then American writers, I mean, obviously that has been too wide a category because they are all over the place. So they probably <laughs> rose in very different ways. And the fact that they were American doesn't explain their use of public. Right. But concluding this case study, so 
we have made some quantitative claims. Public seems to grow in use and its colocats or bigrants become more diverse. But in some cases, it becomes less diverse. So in this religious context, and a transformation in the uses of public seems to take place syntactically, maybe also semantically, in, per in particular from the 1740s onwards. And then qualitatively, we can kind of say that the drop in the religious meaning fits into theories of secularization put forward by people like Jonathan Israel. And uh, the relationship between the public and uh, economic terms coincides with discussions on the rise of commercial society. So very interesting. We could look further into this. Um, here you can refer to the work of Istvan Horn. And uh, we can argue that the movement from noun to adjective kind of reflects the growth in importance of the public sphere, see Habermas. So the, the idea here is that if you use public as a noun, public something, this means that the society requires or allows things to be discussed as being related to the public. So it's, it's not just that the, the public does something, but there are many, many different public things. And you think about the public in a different way, maybe. Right. So about the rise of the public sphere. So indeed, we get things where, whereas previously, and even throughout the sort of 18th century, we talk about the king's purse or the privy purse or the royal purse. Towards the end of the century, we talk more about the public purse. So, and then looking at them royal tax, king's tax, lord tax, that definitely goes down and public tax, tax goes up. So we don't think about it in terms of the king or sort of one ruler anymore. We think about the public as a whole. These are public affairs. And again, like crowns, debt, king's debt, so on. At the end, we get more of public debt. And then there's this need to cross over with religion. So church opinion goes down, public opinion goes up. Right. So that was the second pilot study. And I come to my conclusions about time, I think. So what are we doing right now? So the pilot studies gave us examples of potential approaches. And now we are, <clears throat> we are taking the first systematic steps towards analyzing the language of commercial society. So our objective number two. And uh, we are currently looking into identifying relevant works through their vocabulary. So we are taking the trade and finance section of the historical thesaurus and kind of checking texts against that. And then, so this is kind of a linguistic approach. Uh, based on previous linguistic knowledge from the thesaurus. Um, but then we are also using uh, historical background knowledge. So we are also comparing texts with a hand curated selection of economic literature called, called Goldsmith's Cress Economic Library. And also we will be doing social network analysis to kind of find maybe more people who are in the same sphere or same network as the, the authors of this economic literature. And one of our, or two of our hypotheses are that economic vocabulary spreads to new contexts over time, and there might be a divergence of popular registers versus specialized registers. So, but there are problems with the data. So I've been, <laughs> I think I've mentioned OCI errors quite a few times. And there has been some research on this. There's an impact on both precision and recall. Uh, but ECHO, we can do something to mitigate this. So for example, in suitable occasions, we can compare ECHO with ECHO TCP, which is a small subset of ECHO that doesn't have these OCI errors. So it, it has been keyed in by hand. And then also some methods are more robust than others. So. Uh, Hill and Henschen in this paper looked at some methods and kind of ranked them in terms of how much they are impacted by the OCI errors. And uh, with the methods, we can also get help from other disciplines. So for example, we've been using a software that identifies text reuses, so kind of quotations from other works. And this has been adapted from DNA analysis. So apparently DNA can be kind of be analyzed and make 
DNA can be quite messy, and then they have to tolerate these errors there. And another problem is that the same work is often included multiple times in ECHO, which, I mean, for linguistic research, we probably don't want the data be skewed by multiple instances of the same work. And you think that the ESTC would help with that, but it doesn't really consistently link the different reprints and additions together. So this is something that we've been working on at COMHIS to kind of harmonize the ESTC in this respect. And then we, we have now, uh, to some degree of accuracy, um, kind of work field where we know that, okay, these texts are part of the same work and we can then restrict our analysis to first editions only, for example, if we want. So to conclude, we combine the interests of historical social linguistics, book history, intellectual history, and data science in our digital handling of language data. And to me, the key interest here is that this big data of ECHO and ESTC can benefit both social linguistic description and theory. So we can do things with infrequent phenomena that we wouldn't be able to study in smaller corpora. Uh, so we can analyze lexical changes, we can analyze their social embedding to the extent that these published texts so show a range of sort of social factors. And we can relate language change to change in society, commercial society in our case. And we can test these social linguistic hypotheses of social networks, which is really interesting to me. And I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out how well we can do that with the publishing networks. And I found that this multidisciplinary co collaboration has been both challenging and rewarding. So it's really interesting to be working with historians for a change. So I've been working with uh, computer scientists for a long time and I kind of know how they talk and I, I'm able to work with them, but now kind of coming into another kind of discipline of the humanities and trying to communicate. It's been really interesting. I, I like doing it and I'm really in sort of looking forward to working in this project some more and we'll see where we get. Right, so I think I'll stop here. Thanks for listening. This was quite a long talk. These are my references. Thank you.